everybody doing today? Is everybody doing great? All right, Buddy's doing great. Anybody else doing great? All right, there we go. Fantastic. Good, good. All right, Ellen, are we all set? Fantastic. So I'm going to put this microphone down, and I want you all to tell me if you can still hear me, okay? So can everyone still hear me with this microphone? It's sort of the best it can be with the, the setup. How's that? That's good? Fantastic. Wonderful. I aim for perfection. All right. So, ladies and gentlemen, we are here this morning for a discussion about something called cognitive reserve. So you're probably thinking to yourselves, what is cognitive reserve? Fortunately, I have a couple of answers for you. This is all a part of our Accentuate the Positive, not just in 2022, but for as long as we're here, to make our lives richer, fuller, safer, and happier. Um, and my name is Laura Geisenheimer, and I'm with the Rehabilitation Department. All right. I'd like to open this with a quote I found in a paper that actually was given to me by one of the residents living in this building. Um, it is from the Jewish Exponent. I believe that's from Philadelphia. And it's a fantastic article, and I'm actually going to try and make copies and get them out if you're interested. But this quote is fantastic. The article is called Preventing Alzheimer's Disease, New Science of the Aging Brain. Nor indeed are we to give our attention solely to the body. Much greater care is due to the mind and soul, for they too, like lamps, grow dim with time unless we keep them supplied with oil. Intellectual activity gives buoyancy to the mind. So that's actually a quote by Cicero from 44 BCE. So this is actually something that has been recognized in some capacity for hundreds of years, thousands of years. Um, so welcome here, everyone, today. And the good news is that there is something we can all do to take charge of our minds and build our cognition. So what we'll be covering is what is cognitive reserve? Why is it important? Does my age matter? I'm 50, I'm 70, I'm 90. Does that play a role? Risk factors for reduced cognition? What can I do, and you being the general you and I, to build cognitive reserve? And what is the role of rehabilitation in this? So what is cognitive reserve? Great question. Cognitive reserve is the mind's resistance to damage of the brain. Okay, so we all go out, we do physical exercise. Why do we do physical exercise? Anybody? Yeah, to feel better for our bodies, to get strong, to prevent a fall, to prevent us from feeling not so great, right? Well, why do we need to do cognitive exercise? Well, to feel good. Same concept. Our brain's ability to face different types of damage, deterioration, or illness, and maintain cognitive function are really dependent on that exercise. So, oops, sorry about that. I'm very, being very gentle with this button here because it's sensitive to disconnect. There we go. So a lot of times we hear about use it or lose it, and we hear about things like cognitive reserve, kind of a new concept, but not really. So yes, use it or lose it is absolutely real. I mean, we know if you don't use something, it's going to atrophy. That's just the way of the world. If you don't walk for a month, because you've, God forbid, got hospitalized, your body's a little weaker. Don't use it, you lose it. Cognitive reserve is a little bit different. Um, this hypothesis states that you can do certain kinds of cognitive training that can build further pathways in the brain so that when there is injury, illness, a genetic tendency towards dementia or cognition uh, impairment of a sort, that you have more pathways to compensate than somebody that does not have those pathways built. 
So it's different than use it or lose it. It's not just not using it. It's building additional neurological connections within your brain that we are all capable of doing. So what is the importance of cognitive reserve kind of highlighted in a certain study? Well, there were two 80-year-old women that were in this study. And as you see here, they had the same brain injury, but one presented with really advanced signs of deterioration, and the other one didn't. And then after these two women passed away, an autopsy was performed and showed that both women, in fact, had Alzheimer's disease. And if I'm going to just step back here, because I've gotten a couple of questions about this before, I just want to emphasize dementia is an umbrella. So dementia is the entire cognitive impairment in an umbrella. Within that umbrella falls Alzheimer's, Parkinson's dementia, frontotemporal dementias, other things, but they are all dementia, just for clarification so that you kind of get the concept. So why do you think, if I were to ask you all, that one of these women had tremendous signs of deterioration and the other one did not? Yeah, Ina. So, so, so one of them doing some mental exercises? Mental so one of them was, in fact, doing mental exercises. Does anyone else have any thoughts before I tell you? Nobody, huh? All right. So one of them happened to have quite a bit more of cognitive reserve. This woman had actually learned more languages, studied advanced educational theories, been, had an advanced degree, gone to colleges, traveled the world, continued to remain engaged in activities of living, not just her normal ones, but extra ones, until way beyond when the other woman did. So she actually built cognitive reserve by strengthening pathways so even when she was diagnosed with this dementia form, Alzheimer's, she was more resilient to the damage. So why is it important? Well, I think we've talked about it, right? But if you live in a town, let's say, for example, and the only way you know to get somewhere in the town is one route. Well, what happens if that route is closed? Well, you're just going to go home. That's it. I don't need to go to the supermarket. I didn't need to shop anyway. Well, unfortunately, you do need to shop, right? We all need to get our groceries. We need to go to the doctor, whatever it is. And so when we know more than one pathway, when we have a way around and we can expand our brain's ability to d navigate life in different ways, we are safer. And another thing this article points out that I really like about it is that it calls cognitive reserve an insurance policy. Now, I don't know about you, but I find some insurance things, you know, I sign up and they say, oh, do you want to insure this for an extra $20? I said, no, for what? This is an insurance policy I would get behind. This is something that's free. You just exercise your brain and you are ensuring that should something come up, you have increased resilience to handle it. So the big question, another big question I get is, does age matter? Well, just because we're aging doesn't mean that our cognition should plummet, nor does it mean that you should get dementia. Well, I'm 85, so I'm going to have that forgetfulness anyway. Mm, not necessarily. Yes, we all have a moment where we say, oh gosh, what did I come into this room for? I know I put, oh, hmm, huh. well, it'll come back to me. Or we have our glasses on top of our heads and we say, oh, have you seen my glasses? I've been looking for them for hours. Well, they're on my head. So we all have those kind of normal things, right? But then there comes a point where family starts to notice, friends start to notice. They say, gosh, you know, you've told me that story a couple times now. 
mom, I heard that already. We talked about that. So those are the things that kind of get a little bit more dicey. When you really are starting to get beyond the typical, what we would call forgetfulness. Um, and does age matter? Well, the great news is no. It's not too late. So actually, the US News and World Report in December of 2018, which is really not that long ago, reported the following statement. Scientists believe cognitive reserve is an active coping process that is built up over a lifetime. What you can do in life can contribute to it, even at an older age. And that was from a study uh, at Columbia Medical School. So quite legitimate information there. So what are the risk factors that we have to cognitive decline, right? To losing our ability to manage our cognition. Well, hearing loss is a really big one of them. Um, I apologize for the size here, so I'll read them out loud to you. Something's happening where we can't zoom in so well. But they are hearing loss, which is really important. If your hearing aids do not work or they're not optimally functioning, please get them checked out. Please look into alternative options because if you are not getting stimuli into your brain via your auditory pathways, you are going to lose that input. Those neural pathways are not going to be working like they should be, and then we're gonna have deterioration, okay? So the more you hear, the better, the better developed, and the better you continue to develop those pathways. A sedentary lifestyle or low physical activity. So we all know that's not a shocker. If we sit around on the couch all day and eat potato chips and ice cream and chicken wings, we're not gonna be in the best shape, right? Now everybody has those every once in a while, but not every day, and we've gotta stay active. Diabetes is another big one. So that's not to say that if you have diabetes, you're going to develop dementia, but it is a risk factor. Heart disease and high blood pressure, advanced age, for some, if you do not take care of yourself optimally, reduced education levels, depression, obesity, and smoking. So these are some of many risk factors that exist out there. Are they all of them? No, there's genetic predisposition, all kinds of things. So how can you build your cognitive reserve? Well, there are a ton of ways. One, learn a new hobby. Two, learn a second language. And half of you probably think, what am I gonna learn another language for? I'm 86, who cares? Well, maybe one of your grandchildren is studying Spanish in college or is studying Chinese and you want to converse about that. Or maybe you just want to explore new creation of new neural pathways that you had never done prior to now. Not a bad idea. Exercise your mind and body together. So oftentimes you'll notice if you've ever been in our physical therapy gym um, or in our Willowbrook um, Rehabilitation Center and worked with the therapists there, they'll often have you do what's called dual tasking. So we'll have you physically exercise while we also work your brain. I may have you do high knees like this while having you name as many things that you can that start with the letter A. Boy, is that hard to do. While you're doing this, do you know how much people go, apple, ape, ape, lose concept of both. To manage both of those is a very hard task. Challenge the components of your mind with rehab's help. So what do we do? Well, we have you complete baseline cognitive evaluation talk about your interests, your passions, your hobbies, and kind of narrow down ways to help you find methods to do this and build a long-term path to continue to achieve it. One of the things I like to touch on that isn't necessarily in this presentation, but I'm really passionate about is routines. So how many of you out there have a routine? If you're not raising your hand, you are not telling me the truth. 100%, okay, because every single one of us wakes up in the morning, whatever we do, 
first is on you, but we brush our teeth, brush our hair, eat our breakfast, get dressed, doesn't matter what order it's in, but usually for everybody, it's the same order, right? That gives us a sense of grounding, a sense of purpose, because if we woke up and we said, oh goodness, oh, I don't know what to do first, we would have no order. We would feel kind of lost, right? So routine helps us. Routine grounds us, and it does, in fact, guide us. But routine can also kind of act as a hindrance in some ways. If we are not going outside of what we normally do to explore new pathways, to talk to new people, to take new classes, to read different kinds of books, to try different kinds of puzzles, to visit a different museum. Whatever it is that we're not doing, we're not challenging those pathways. So as we age, our routine circle becomes smaller and smaller and smaller. What we need to do is make sure that it grows. So even after retirement, life's work does not stop. We continue to read, we continue to educate ourselves. What are some of the things that we work on? This is a tiny list compared to a lot of the things we do. But for example, some people can't actually sustain attention. We find that, oh, when I was 50, 60, 70 even, I was able to read a whole novel. In fact, I read this whole historical fiction and it was wonderful. Now I can attend to it for about 10 minutes and I really just can't focus anymore. Or I've forgotten what I read. Uh, well, that's kind of a problem because you need all of that cognitive capacity to continue building neural pathways, developing extraordinary routine roots. How about cognitive flexibility? Well, we talked about that route you were taking to your appointment and the road is closed. Well, what are you gonna do now? You have to experience and evidence some kind of cognitive flexibility. What about working memory? Oh, I don't need that. Is that so? Well, last I heard when you call someone and they say, hi, thank you for calling office of Practor and Practor, can we just tell you if you're calling for this push one, if you're calling for this push two, if you're calling for this push three, and actually we're not here between the hours of two and four, and then we'll be here closed Monday and Wednesday. Whoa, what did I just hear? I have no idea. Now, fortunately you can hear some of these messages again, right? You call back or you push repeat prompts, but while they're giving you that information, you're having to hold it store it, sometimes manipulate it, and then write it back down on your planner afterwards so you can get there, or so that you remember what time your appointment is. Or maybe you went to the doctor and you were talking about your blood pressure, which was at a dangerous level last week, and he gives you a whole bunch of information about how you need to manage that. Well, while he's telling you all that information, where are you storing it? Did you leave your doctorate appointment and say, oh, well, I know my blood pressure was high, but I, I forgot what I'm supposed to do. That's problematic, right? So cognitive reserve is really the name of the game. We need to fortify our cognition so that we are resilient to these outside traumas, same as you need to fortify your body. We modify health factors, we educate, we get social support, we continue to engage, we stimulate our minds and our bodies. Now, I would like to share one more quote with you from this article. And again, if you are interested in having it, I would be more than happy to share it with you. Uh, but I happen to love also this quote. If I had my life to live over again, I would make it a rule to read some poetry, listen to some music, and see some painting or drawing at least once a week. For perhaps the part of my brain now atrophied 
would then have been kept alive through life. The loss of these tastes is a loss of happiness. We are here for you in the rehabilitation department. It doesn't just mean that you have to come when you had a stroke or you had a fall or you had a hip that broke. We are here all the time. We are here for your continued cognitive thriving. It's hard to thrive in our environment when we're ignoring our cognition. And I think a lot of us are afraid of our cognitive decline and we're afraid to spend time with people that have cognitive decline, like almost as if it's catching, right? Which I just can't have dinner with her. Do you know how forgetful she is? But we're here as a community to support one another and to build ourselves up together. So I encourage each and every one of you to think truly, am I having any deficits in these areas? It doesn't mean you're not strong, you're not smart, you're not able to come back from that. It just means that you're identifying it and you're taking first steps to bettering your cognition and your thriving life here in ACTS. Thank you all for coming. I'd like to open this up to questions if anybody has questions. Thank you, Toby. Rudy. Let me give you the microphone if you don't mind so that I could just have everybody hear you. Well, for the recording, I mean, I want everyone on, it's being recorded. Years ago, Oris Martin ran courses here. Oris Martin, all right? She was the exercise lady, all right? And she got transferred to uh, St. Andrew South, okay? And she ran these cases. I, I attended them even before I moved in, and they were wo working out very nicely. Then uh, she started up with uh, Cynthia Green's total um, brain. You know about Cynthia Green, okay? And that program, ACTS was evaluating, all right? And to continue it, I actually uh, used to go to South to, uh, to work out with Oris. You know, b this was before the, it was COVID. Anyway, all of this sort of died, all right? Now, even your class now, which there's a group of us who used to come and uh, besides enjoying it, got a lot out of it. And now, gone, all right? What I'm just trying to say is, why is Axe cutting all of this stuff out? So um, I don't know if you all heard the question, but the question was, um, um, Rudy was sharing that there used to be a, a woman here that ran a certain kind of exercise class and then paired up with a cognitive teacher who uh, they kind of had a program running. And Rudy shared that that is no longer in existence. Um, and he said that he was attending that class at St. Andrews for a while. Um, I don't know if that's still in existence uh, there. I really can't tell you. Um, and Rudy's also talking about a uh, group we used to hold here, um, which we will be visiting again once a month. We used to do it every Monday here. Um, unfortunately, what happens is, I don't know about the one that um, Oris paired up with that was a cognitive class, but when you work with a speech pathologist, which is what I am, we're speech language pathologists, which is kind of a weird name because most people say, I talk fine, and they pretend to have a stutter, and they say, I talk fine. Well, I'm not just a speech therapist. I do everything from the lungs up to the brain. So that's cognition, neuroscience, language, speech, swallowing, voice, and everything in between. So when you do a, a group with me or a session with me, it's 
basically a very clinically skilled Medicare approved and backed session. So the other things are kind of outside exercisers, like you go to take a gym class. That's a, a trainer who's trained, but is also not a physical therapist. So they're not trained in the nuances, per se, of rehabilitation and building these cognitive or physical pathways. Um, unfortunately, because of how much I have to do here in this community and how many people I'm working with, because people are starting to recognize what we do and wanting to take advantage of it. I just don't have the ability to meet every week anymore. Um, but the good news is that Medicare, in a very good way, is paying for these things now because I think for a long time, and we all know this, our Medicare, our healthcare system in general has been sick care. We're not really well care. We're kind of reactive. Right, But now Medicare is starting to back this proactive coverage. They want to identify this cognition, this physicality, before it becomes a really big issue to the point where you're in a wheelchair or you can't come back from whatever illness you had or now you've lost all of your independence and you have to move. And they're really trying to avoid that. So these are skilled clinical interventions that we're providing either on a one-on-one -on -one basis or at eventually in a group. I know that's hard to kind of answer exactly your question, but I can't comment what's happening at other buildings because I don't know. Roz. I can definitely look into it for you um, and get back to you. Yeah, I can look into that. Anybody else have a question? Rudy. Oh, she's here. Guess what? We are, guess how many patients I have on caseload right now? 26. There's two of us. So hopefully we can continue to get more of us and more help. But as we grow, the needs grow, which is fantastic because people are taking advantage of it. And it's not about business. It's not about money. I'm here. I get paid. It doesn't matter to me. I'm trying to help residents. And so if I have 26 residents on my caseload, it doesn't leave, and that's only Sabrina and myself, it doesn't leave a lot of leeway. Yes, Toby. I think that's I think that's a great point and you are a wonderful person and we are glad to have you in this community and I commend you for all of those things you're talking about that's fantastic um, I think that it uh, personality absolutely plays a part I think sometimes people don't know where to start um, and we all feel that way in one way or another. We don't really know where to start. Maybe it's an exercise program. Maybe we know we want to work out. We want to exercise. But we don't know what exactly to do. We don't know which machines to use or how long to walk or how much weight to lift, right? And so in those ways, we use skilled clinical professionals like the physical therapy team to work with you. Maybe it's only for two weeks and to help develop an exercise program program for you. There's even the ability with cognition and with physicality that these people can work with you, all of us, and develop for cognition or for physicality 
a catered program and check in with you six times in 30 days just to see how you're doing with that new program. So you can have one-on-one -on -one sessions for those three times in the gym or once in your apartment to follow up on that. Because I think a lot of people are very, like you say, self-directed. They know that they should do Hebrew and they should learn a, a, a new um, sport and they should take a new kind of puzzle from the paper. But a lot of people aren't sure where to start. Sure. You know, that's always the, the story of life, right? There's always people that just don't really care, no matter what you're talking about, inevitably. I mean, that's, that's the nature of human beings. We are some that really are avidly seeking something and some that really aren't. Um, I don't want anybody to upturn their whole life. I don't want anybody to feel like they need to go sign into, you know, uh, 12 hours a day of a lecture at FAU. But what I really do want to encourage is to not fall into that, well, I've retired and I already did that work. So, nah. Because a lot of times I see it and I can only share with you my experience that I have um, and hope that it ignites some kind of flame. But I see people at the end of the road when they say, why am I here? Why, why, why don't I have any friends around me? Why don't I remember anything? Or they don't even remember that they don't remember. But they're devastated that they have no more independence. That, I mean, things don't just stay. You have to maintain them. And so I implore everybody to really think of it not as an entire upheaval, but just adding one tiny extra oomph to the rest of your day because it gets to the point where people are at the very end of their lives and have regrets. And my personal reason for becoming a therapist and doing what I do is that when I age, when I am hopefully lucky enough to get to the age of 80 or 90, that I want to be able to communicate what I want to say. I want to be able to tell people what I need and what I think and what I feel. And I want to be able to eat what I want to eat. I want to be able to enjoy it. Because I know at some point I will not be able to physically wash myself or get in the shower alone or maybe even feed myself, but I want to be able to swallow and I want to be able to tell you that I'm hungry or sad or cold. And I want to maintain that language to be able to convey that no matter what happens. To me, that's really critical. And I think we lose sight of that and we all become that infamous, well, it'll never happen to me, kind of impervious feeling. And unfortunately, it absolutely can. Yeah, sure. Yes, I'm sorry, I don't know your name. Bonnie. 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 Uh, <laughs> you know, uh, honestly, it's a, a doozy, and I never, nobody gets it right, but it's Geisenheimer. Geisenheimer. You got it, Geisenheimer. Yeah, would you believe I spent a lot of money to go to graduate school and I spelled it out phonetically for the person who was reading out our degrees. And don't you know, they said, Laura, <laughs> my family didn't know to watch me coming across the stage. Nobody knew. And I was like, it's me. <laughs> Nobody heard my name. Oh, well, so it's Geisenheimer. Yeah. Any other questions? Absolutely, please do. Yes, Gail. Let me grab you this if that's okay, Gail, because I just want people to hear you. And there is a recording. I complained 
um, other people that I was having more difficulty with my memory when 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 I moved here a few months back and um, uh, I did get a prescription from my primary care person, and I worked with your department, and I think benefited greatly from, I think it was two months. Is, would that sound? Yeah, that was three times a week. Uh, it, was three, it was three times a week in my apartment, and, and she taught me lots of little tricks, and now I use my iPad daily and do certain kind of puzzles, and I enjoy it. I look forward to it. But I still feel my short-term memory is lacking. Now, what do I do to, I, I know I'm sure my primary would write another prescription, but I mean, is this a, a normal way to approach this? Absolutely, so just to reiterate the question was, and thank you, Gail, that um, Gail has received our services in the past and is actually wondering if she could do it again and how she would do that because short-term memory is something that's really important and that a lot of times people think, oh, that might be slipping a little bit for me. You know, it might not have been before, but I, I really think it is now. So you can absolutely get back on therapy. And the way to do that is to get a prescription from your physician, your primary care physician, or a neurologist that can write speech therapy, evaluation, and treatment. And we will get that order. We'll run your insurance. We'll let you know, yep, Medicare covers you. You're great. Your evaluation will be scheduled whenever we can or let plan a time that works for both of us. Um, and then what we would work to do is really cater what you felt you didn't get enough of or that you are, you got, but it that kind of fell by the wayside or you've since lost it and build up a plan around that. So that even when we discharge you, you have a guide to follow. Because I think we often feel lost about what should we do? How should we do it? But you'll have kind of a hand holding on paper that will lead you the way you need to go. Sure, thank you. Any other questions? Thank you, Ina, thank you. Thank you all so much for coming here. I commend you for taking the first step to think about your cognition and your cognitive health, and I encourage you to keep following that path. Thank you all.